Hello Snacks, welcome back, my name is Jack. We've got a blocky bunch of updates today. I won't waste time with an intro, let's get straight into it. We begin with this story that started three days ago and it's been update after update. Am I the a-hole for telling a friend that my husband can't be cheating on me and she's just projecting? For context, I, 31 female, have been with my husband, Jay, 34 male, for 10 years. We met through mutual friends, began dating shortly after, and became engaged after being together for about two years. We aren't legally married yet, as we both agreed we wanted an all-out wedding and to travel for our honeymoon, but that is expensive, and we wanted to prioritize spending our money on things like our house, our vehicles, medical, and so on. We bought each other matching rings that we wear as if we are married, and refer to each other as husband and wife, and present as married socially. We just haven't actually had a wedding. Our families understand this, and since we are both children of divorce, our parents were fine with us not wanting to get married, since their opinion of marriage was somewhat skewed, to put it politely. Most of our friends also don't comment on our lack of being officially married, as they either don't care, uh, agree with our logic that there are more important things to spend money on, or are the sort of people who think the point of a legal marriage isn't as necessary as it has been in the past. But then there's Trisha, 28 female. I met Trisha through an old job and we got along really well. We enjoyed the same music, food, and had similar opinions on things like movies, books, and clothes. Now, Trisha is a lovely person, and I do enjoy genuinely her friendship, but she occasionally goes through these odd phases where she analyzes the behavior of the men in our social circle. She will then present her theories to us ladies based on things like social media posts, odd behaviors, as she says she noticed during the group barbecues or beach trips, things like that. Now, while I have no problem calling out the potential terrible behavior in a friend, the things she does or seem suspicious don't really hold water in my opinion. For example, she's never quite let go of considering a male friend gay, and her evidence is that he's a bit of a perpetual bachelor. According to him, his bachelor status is because he's holding out for a girl who doesn't mind his transient lifestyle as a man who has to travel a lot for work and would want to join him rather than wait around at home. But but according to Trisha, well, he must be having gay dalliances across the country and refuse it to tell us. Even though many in our friend group are gay, out of the closet, and even bring their partners to social events. Now, in case you want to theorize, it's because Trisha got rejected by him one time. And that's why she's certain he must be gay because he didn't want to sleep with her. Hush you. No spoilers. Then there's my sweet Jay. Jay has never been a very physically affectionate person, and he is likely autistic, but isn't interested in having a formal diagnosis. He took the RADS-R uh, test to screen for autism in undiagnosed adults about four years ago when he was seeking treatment for chronic migraines, and the results suggested strongly that he may be autistic. But once he got those results back, he sort of got over the idea of wanting answers for some of his mental health questions, preferring to just go to therapy and work on finding good treatment for his migraines. According to him, the RADS-R was good enough to solve the mystery and provided some closure for him. I didn't press the issue, as the idea of getting on his case about a diagnosis he didn't feel he needed seemed unnecessarily harsh to me. So on top of that, Jay loves fishing. When you put these two facts together, hopefully a picture gets painted for you, but I'll clarify anyway. He knows all about the different types of aquatic environments in our area that you can legally fish, when all the different spawning seasons are, what every species eats, how they hunt, and he can even tell what sort of fish is on his hook based on how it feels when he's pulling them in. Okay, so man has level 99 fishing in RuneScape. Seems about right. He can look at a body of water and instantly tell you if fishing will be good that day, and he has never been wrong. It's like living with a fish-based psychic. Uh, since I am an avid lover of seafood, his fishing and pursuit of fish-centric knowledge has only been a boon to me. I can express interest in wanting a fish dinner on Monday morning, and that night, he will bring home and cook up enough fish for us to eat like royalty. He's even excited to catch fish to make into fertilizer for my new rose bushes. Since he feels confident he will be able to pull up the perfect food for my new roses. So the suspicious activity, according to Trisha, is that he often goes on spur-of-the-moment fishing trips by himself and can sometimes be gone for hours. He will randomly stand up, say something like, 
All right, fishing time, and give me a kiss before he hits the road. Now, while I would ordinarily agree that something like that could be suspicious, I know factually that Jay isn't cheating, as he always sends me countless pictures and videos while he's on these trips, as well as calling me on the phone when he's particularly excited about a good catch, how he's trying to get uniquely sneaky fish, a cool bird he saw, things like that. Even if he's gone for 10 hours, my phone will be blowing up for all 10 of those hours with pictures of his sunshine smile next to a fish or videos of him cheering as he shows me what he's got on the stringer. A long, thin rope used to keep fish alive, but attached to your boat in the water. I adore these pictures, videos, and phone calls since they make my heart so full with how much joy he feels and how at peace he is on the water. Now, I would join him more often, but I usually stay home since it wouldn't be fair to our dogs if both of us left for undefined amounts of time on a whim. Instead, I find my peace in watching through his eyes. And when he comes home, I'm always happy to get the play-by-play -play of how the trip went while Jay prepares the fish for us to eat. We even have a game now where he quizzes me on what types of fish he caught, and if I win, I get a big hug. Jesus Christ, OP, we get it. You've got the frickin' gold lottery of a partner. <laughs> <laughs> See, ladies, this is what you're missing out on when you don't give these fish profiles on Tinder a chance. But see, none of this is good enough for Trisha. For years now, she has had her suspicions about Jay, but I've always brushed them off as I'm secure in my relationship and trust Jay implicitly. When Trisha first brought her theory to me, I brought it up to Jay, who was genuinely hurt and asked if I shared in her suspicions and wanted him to go fishing less. I told him no, but that I felt he deserved to know what Trisha was telling people about him. Now, he understood and was willing to let sleeping dogs lie. But over the years, as Jay and I kept on keeping on, unmarried and in fishy bliss, Trisha became more and more adamant that not only was Jay cheating, but the reason we weren't married is that he convinced me to wait for an expensive wedding and he would rather continue on cheating during fake fishing trips. Her proof was his random trips, the fact that he doesn't physically touch me a lot when we are in public, and how he never lets me go with him. Now, countless times I have shown her the giant folder of fishing pictures and videos in my phone, call logs showing how often we are communicating, and told her that I didn't need to have him grabbing on me or dangling off of me in public to feel secure with him. I've brought up our responsibilities as dog owners to not leave them alone for hours on a bin without the ability to relieve themselves outside. I've even told her multiple times over the years that she's more than welcome to ask Jay if she could tag along on a trip and see for herself how committed he is to fishing, but she always refuses. Again, since Jay has been fine with ignoring the drama, I let it slide up until about a week ago. Jay was talking about going on a day-long fishing trip with two of our friends, Vince and Maria, who are married, as they had expressed interest in going and saw the trip as a sort of blend between staycation and a chartered boat trip. So Trisha spoke privately with me, saying that I must be happy that Maria is going since she will be able to ensure that not only Jay can't cheat on me, but that Vince can't cover for him if he tries to. I'd finally had enough, as now she was dragging poor Vince into this and slandering his character when all Vince had done is agree to a day trip with an old friend. I told Trisha that she needs to either bring her suspicions directly to Jay and hash it out with him or let it go. Because as far as I'm concerned, she's projecting her issues onto Jay since Trisha can't keep a guy longer than three months. Now, while that assessment isn't entirely true, I wanted to hurt her feelings and cut her down to size. Since that's my sweet Jay she's dragging through the mud. Trisha not only took it personally, but said that I was just naive and was afraid to be single. So I told Trisha that she was projecting, again, since she's a serial dater who scares men off with her wannabe Sherlock Holmes nonsense, and she just can't fathom a man with a real hobby because she only goes after half-baked fake gym bros more interested in their own t <laughs> their own tits than hers and wannabe finance bros who blow their entire paychecks on crypto. She stopped talking to me after that and hasn't reached out to me since. Granted, I haven't reached out to her either, but I'm mad at her because she was rude. Our friend group doesn't really give this entire situation much weight, saying stuff like, oh, that's just how she is, or, oh, what did you expect? Or, we know Jay isn't cheating, but he's an exception to the rule, and maybe Trisha just doesn't see that. While I was willing to stand my ground at first and not budge on the issue, now I'm wondering if maybe I was too harsh and I should apologize for being petty just because I wanted to knock her down a peg and get her to give up on her theories. So to give the TLDR in case you can't be bothered listening to all of that, my female friend is convinced my husband is cheating on me because he freaking loves fishing and goes on day trips frequently. And after years of hearing her doubts and showing proof that he's faithful, I snapped at her, insulted her taste in men, and spoke negatively about her dating history. So naturally, with how amazing Jay sounds as a husband, uh, there's not really much defense for Trisha's behavior 
behavior at all. To the point where some people actually think Opie is the a-hole for actually allowing Trisha to be going on like this for years on end. Like at this point, you have just been enabling her and encouraging her to do this because you just brush it off. Putting your foot down was a long time coming. So a day after, we get one update, which we can kind of just summarize through, as Opie basically has a heart-to-heart -heart with Jay and deciding how to be treating their friendships going forward, as well as the fact that her and Jay are actually going to be going fishing together now for the afternoon. How cute. So yeah, essentially, Opie shows Jay the Reddit post she made, and Jay appreciates everyone for all their support towards Opie, his wife. And as they have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart together, they also discuss the levels of attachment they have to the individuals in their friend group, and both agree that they've actually been holding on to these friendships more out of nostalgia and desire to be kind, rather than actually checking of, hey, are these people actually healthy for us now, still? Are they actually enriching our lives? Notably in the way they are being towards Trisha and sort of tolerating her behavior. Ultimately deciding that, yeah, enough is enough and they should really be setting boundaries. And that while Jay is a good man, OP is freaking angry. Going on to say, I allowed a venomous waste of air around my sweet Jay. My Jay. She slandered him, belittled me, devalued what we have, and I allowed it. Like some sort of coward. It's going to end now, and I'm ending it my way. I will not be allowing Trisha to slink away from this or have room to twist words to make me look like anything other than a woman with righteous fury regarding the man she vowed to honor and protect. See, it's language and vindiction like this that makes me completely frustrated with the idea that only masculine people behave like this. This is a masculine trait. Like, no, it's a human trait. This woman isn't talking about beating the hell out of Trisha, but she's talking about destroying her, and god damn is it hot. We don't live in the medieval or caveman ages anymore. It's all about spoken word. It's all about verbal psychological warfare, and no one does that better than women. She goes on, I'm sorry to report I will not be taking the high road, nor will I be handling this with tact and decorum. I'm blowing this big social life sky freaking high, along with anybody who sides with her. Scorched earth, no prisoners, blood for the blood god. So yeah, thank goodness I came across these stories after the final update was already posted because there was no way I would be wanting to have to wait on that cliffhanger. So here we go, folks. Just 11 hours ago, this was posted. How did Opie absolutely ruin Trisha's social circle? I'm going to keep this as brief as possible while still covering it as there is a lot to cover involving about 15 people and it's all still hitting the fan. Added the NSFW flair as some adult topics will be mentioned below, including potential SA and drug abuse. So during the afternoon fishing trip yesterday, Today, I blocked Trisha on everything and reached out to people to say that Jay and I would be distancing ourselves from Trisha, why we were, and shared what theory Trisha had about them if there was one, along with any screenshots or evidence I had of Trisha talking about them. I also asked a few friends who might know if Trisha might be interested in Jay, as some people pointed out that that might have been a motivation for her to get between us. So here's what's been dug up so far. So Matt, that traveling friend Trisha alleged was gay, confirmed again that he isn't gay. But he shared a story about how he, his roommate, and Trisha had a get-together at one point where they drank and smoked some weed. Now, during the night, Trisha got handsy and tried getting together with Matt's roommate, who declined. When they sobered up the following morning, Trisha said that it should be fine because a man like that sort of thing. After that, Matt and his roommate weren't comfortable with her and effectively barred her from going to their place. Matt suspects this is the origin of the gay rumor and he's chosen to step away from the social group to reevaluate some things. I didn't want to press him, so I left it there. Vince and Maria have gone dark. Maria believed that Trisha was the victim in all of this, and Vince was vague in his responses and seemed to be taking a more hands-off approach, but they stopped responding when another friend sent a screenshot of Trisha alluding to them being swingers because they have a decorative pineapple on their kitchen counter. Neither of them have anyone blocked, but no one can get a response out of them either. Okay, well, you know, that it's not exactly denying Trisha's theory, then, is it? <laughs> it's either they're ashamed for accusing Trisha of being the victim in all this, or they're embarrassed that uh, Trisha was so observant. Which, either way, is kind of surprising. I mean, they seem to like to be a very accepting group of people. One friend got into an argument with his girlfriend after said girlfriend went through his phone because of the drama and found either texts or pics, I don't know which, that, according to her, 
prove that he's been sleeping with Trisha on and off. I heard this from his brother, who reached out after the girlfriend left a voicemail saying she's kicking the friend out, and the brother wanted to know what was going on. I'm not sure exactly what's happening there, as that friend has also gone dark, and none of us know the girlfriend very well or have her phone number. One friend came clean about her struggles with prescription pain meds after her mother lost her battle with cancer because Trisha had been trying to blackmail her into getting dirt on Matt, Jay, and Vince and was using the drug abuse as leverage. Apparently, a lot of my attention got diverted after this came to light because that's a much bigger problem than my beef with Trisha. We are still working on creating a good way for people to be a support system for her moving forward, and that will be what we as a group will focus on from here on out. An old friend of Jay's also dropped a nuke by revealing that Trisha tried blowing him in the bathroom during a Friendsgiving dinner we had last year only to turn around and try to blow a different guy in the bathroom after Chris turned her down. Ugh, oh man. Jay, some other friends, and I created a new Discord server for all of the friends coming out of this drama against Trisha, and so far, it's just been a lot of comparing dates, texts, and Discord DMs, but it looks like Trisha has been trying to either sleep with or break up every guy in the friend group, as well as either get rid of or get leverage on every girlfriend in the group. Either way, we have bigger fish to fry now. It's time to put this all behind us and help our friend who really needs it. Thank you all for your kind words and helpful advice, even the harsh stuff. Like, I mean, damn, Trisha was like speedrunning all the different medals you could get for being a terrible scummy friend. Blackmail, trying to hook up with everyone's partner. I mean, f <laughs> Oh, wow! It's amazing what people can get away with when the entire friend group is too busy trying to just tolerate that nostalgia and stuff. Over to another flare of drama where people actually turn a bit against OP's decisions in the update. I think my husband's having an affair in our camper van. So my husband convinced me to buy a camper van during lockdown back in 2020, but I'm starting to think to regret the decision. My female intuition is telling me he's using it to get up to no good. We only really use the camper in the summer, but recently my husband, who works from home, seems to be spending more time there using it as an excuse to go on overnight work trips or seeing he uses it as his office, which is kind of plausible, I suppose. I haven't got any hard evidence, but I went in there the other day and there was a stench of female perfume and it definitely wasn't mine. Should I be worried? Are camper fans affairs a thing now? So here was some great suggestions at the time. Next time he says he's working in the camper van, say you could do with a short break yourself and that you're coming with. His reaction should tell you what you need to know. And it could be that he's having an affair or that he needs some alone time. Oh, true. He might actually be dressing up as a woman and sitting in the camper van drinking wine, alone and feeling pretty. Now, some argued, though, that, hey, if they had a camper van themselves and were feeling stressed, yeah, it would actually be used as a bit of an alone time thing. Why not? What a great little camp uh, camper van getaway experience of sorts. But uh, yeah, it turns out this is actually a common thing. My father-in-law had a camper van affair. It was on the beach. We asked if we could use it for my birthday. He drove three hours one way to get it ready for our visit. I knew then that he was having an affair, but it took another four years for everyone to realize I was right. Yeah, my dad got a camper van conversion in the 70s. We did camp in it. I was confused that he would use it to commute to his job in the city 40 miles away when he had a gas saver sitting at home. Years later, he was caught using smex workers on his lunch breaks. He also was very cool about picking up hitchhikers, but I can't recall us picking up any guys. So that post was 10 days ago, and 18 hours ago now, Opie has come back with an update. After a quick revision of the previous post, Post OP begins, well, after my suspicions continue to eat away at me, I decided to do some investigating of my own on Saturday night while he was out with friends. And unfortunately, my worst fears were confirmed when I found sexy underwear that definitely wasn't mine stuffed in a drawer inside the camper. When my husband got home, I was standing in the doorway, lingerie in hand. After some initial denial, he tried to say he'd brought the underwear for me, which would have been believable if A, it still had the tags on it and and B, if it was actually in my size. He finally admitted to having an affair. At one point, he got on his knees asking for my forgiveness and saying it was a one-off blah blah blah. But the betrayals cut deep, and I'm still trying to process everything. But after pouring my heart out to friends over the past couple of days, one in particular found herself in a similar situation and is actually going through a divorce at the moment. So I've decided unconventional betrayal needs to be met with an unconventional reaction, and rather than wallow in pity, I'm taking matters into my own hands. Last night, after a few glasses of wine and with my soon-to-be-divorced friend by my side, I signed up to a couple of married dating sites. I mean, one actually dubs itself 
the UK's leading married dating site. I mean, these things actually exist? Now, yes, I know you shouldn't fight fire with fire, but this is about revenge, taking control, and refusing to be the victim. I want him to feel exactly how I felt. If he thought he could get away with doing whatever he was doing in our camper van, right under my nose without any consequences, he's got another thing coming. Now, I was in the party at the time of, hell yeah, he's not respecting the relationship, so you don't need to respect him either. That is until I came across this very valid comment. Just so you're aware, this might not turn out the way you think. Your husband won't feel what you felt because if he cared that much to begin with, he'd never have cheated. He's more likely to feel this as a hit to his pride and cheaters are notoriously good at mental gymnastics. He may start telling all your friends and family that you're cheating or that you cheated first and that he's a victim who was willing to work things out. He may even decide to divorce anyway and claim your infidelity as the cause, which, depending on state and prenup, could affect what you come out with. So so just be careful that these decisions don't come back to bite you later. And more would share the sentiment that, yeah, it's, this only really leads to destruction. It's not going to make you look like the innocent victim in all this. It's going to make you look like someone equally the perpetrator in all this. Not to mention the worst possibility. Uh, the only reason I ever regretted cheating back on my ex was because he realized he got off thinking about me sleeping with other men and asked me to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn it. <laughs> it's like being a supervillain, but every time you try to hit someone, you accidentally just help them and you try to kick them in the back, but you end up just fixing their sore spine. But hey, for everyone saying this kind of stuff, there's also people saying that they did it themselves and don't regret ever sort of revenge cheating in the first place. So where do you stand with it? Are you one to want to, you know, take the high ground and try to come as clean as you can? Or do you want to be that person who takes a chance at getting some revenge? Are you capable of finding some joy in that? Or do you feel like it's just going to make you feel worse because you realize that wasn't actually what you truly needed and what you really needed was just to feel desirable and loved in a more genuine way instead of someone who's just willing to sleep with you because you were keen. Like, that's where I think about this. If you were actually going to get some satisfaction from doing this, you would have already been cheating at some point yourself, or at least been fantasizing the theory of it, but you haven't. You're doing this out of reaction, and I think that's what's going to make this unhealthy for you. I think you should sort out the divorce process first, and hey, while you're divorcing, maybe then go ahead and do it all, you know? But uh, yeah, uh, let me know what you think about this and we'll move on. Am I the a-hole for divorcing my wife over getting a massage? So this story began about two weeks ago with the recent update, concluding just earlier today. My soon-to-be ex-wife and I are both in our late 30s. We've been together 12 years, married for 10. We are in a dead bedroom. It was totally dead for six months before I filed for divorce. It was on life support and ICU for five to six years before that. We both wanted to be younger parents and both wanted two kids. We conceived our daughter almost immediately after getting married. Now, now, when she was six months old, we started trying to have the second child, but it never happened. After three years, we started seeing fertility specialists and found out we both have pretty serious reproductive issues. The doctor told us our daughter was nothing short of a miracle and said it was against all odds that we not only conceived, but carried to term. It was after this that the intimacy life began to seriously decline. Initially, I thought it was just the pain of finding out and knowing we wouldn't be able to afford the fertility options and I figured it would get better better over time. It never did, it only got worse. Five years ago, I would say we have slept together 15 to 20 times that year. In 2023, we did it three times. I have tried everything to improve this. Spicing things up, talking, I suggested counseling. I more than pull my weight around the house. We both work and work basically the same hours. I'm telling this because the usual stuff I read on Reddit about how the wife does it all is not even close to true. Now over time, I have grown more and more resentful. The thing that makes me the most resentful is she knows I have a high libido and just doesn't care. I, on the other hand, know she loves to be rubbed on and massaged and I never took that from her. I probably rub on her 325 times a year year. Almost every night I will rub her calves, shins, ankles, and feet. Four to five nights a month, I will go big and do neck, shoulder, back, butt, hamstring, quads, shins, calves, ankles, and feet. I noticed that doing the big massages was the best way to get intimate, as she was more likely to allow me to do the foreplay things I know work on her if I had already done this prep. I did them more often a few years ago, but now not as much. The success rate was never that great, maybe 20% of the time, but in the last two years, we are definitely in the single digits. When we hit the four months of absolutely no intimacy, I decided I wasn't rubbing on her ever again. It 
only took three days for her to notice, and when she asked me to, I told her no, and I got angry. I said, why should I when you don't even give a frick about what I want? Obviously not my finest moment, and a huge argument followed. Things got ice cold at home, but I wasn't giving in. I was tired of all of it. A few weeks ago, she told me, fine, I will just start seeing a professional misuse. I said, okay, then I will start seeing Smex workers. She said that was cheating. I said, oh, fine, I won't, but you will not be getting a massage from anyone else. That is also cheating. So she said I was being ridiculous, and I said, no, it's being touched in an intimate way by another. If I can't have that, neither can you. And I swear to God, if you do, I will file for divorce that day. The following weekend, she went to get her nails done. I know how long it takes for her to get her nails done. She came back almost an hour and a half later than I expected. She didn't say anything, just acted normal. I got on her credit card app on my phone, and sure enough, there was a $95 charge to the goddamn massage person in the same strip mall as the nail place. I lost it. And when I did, so did she. I think we both let out years of frustration on each other. True to my word, though, I called a divorce lawyer on Monday. The only part that upset me was my lawyer said, based on the circumstances, I couldn't list infidelity as the reason for divorce and had to go with Iraq. Iraq. <laughs> God damn it. Irreconcilable differences. I swear I know English. So anyway, she has been telling people we are divorcing because she got a massage. Since then, I have had a number of family members and friends call me and say I'm an a-hole. Some of them, even when I tell them my real reasons, still think I'm an a-hole and that my reasons aren't good enough. Personally, I think getting a massage when told not to is plenty of reasoning. So am I the a-hole here? Now, personal notes, I reread this and I know it comes off angry. But I am angry. Angry at myself for wasting so many years. But but I'm also angry because this was the ultimate frick you. She just went and did it anyway and didn't even try to hide it. Literally went to the same place next to the nail salon and used her credit card, which I pay like I wasn't going to see the charge. Now, obviously, I'm going to have a huge bias about this because I consider physical intimacy to be a very serious thing to our relationship. And I just, I personally can't see how he isn't wrong here to find her getting massages from someone else to be a form of cheating when she literally treats massages as a form of intimacy between them. Like it's the only gateway to intimacy they have. Like a wise comment here says, the last straw is almost always something small and stupid, but it's just the latest in a long line of hurts. So, regardless of how you feel on the end of this, we'll get an update two weeks later with Opie informing us that the soon-to-be ex had met with him yesterday to hash out some details of this divorce, and turns out it was actually pretty productive. We agreed on a 50-50 custody arrangement. Basically, a week there, week here, becomes two weeks during summer break. We each keep our own retirements, splitting the savings 60-40, her favor. Each keep our primary vehicle. I made a huge concession on the house. It was my idea. I want our child to grow up in that house. Ours was a three bedroom with a finished basement and nice yard. I don't want her to live in a pair of two bedroom apartments. This is important to me. I'll be paying a housing alimony each month to offset some costs since my rent and projected utilities etc are much lower than the mortgages, utility and upkeep. But we did agree on some stipulations that would end that. So one, if another adult should move in, boyfriend or new husband, my obligation ends immediately. My my obligation also ends when our daughter moves out or turns 22, whichever comes first. And three, there's a bunch of other different scenarios we talked about in terms of splitting the house and if she wishes to sell it, I won't bore you with all of that, but basically as long as I continue to make the alimony payment, I'll get a 40% at time of sale or a buyout. Turning this all to the lawyer within the week, and while the uh, soon-to-be ex definitely had a you are beneath me vibe, during our meeting I'm happy this doesn't look like it will be an ugly divorce as I was very worried it would be. I assume our daughter is the most motivating factor for her sudden amicable attitude. And so it seems that despite uh, the rough mess of it all, they are ending things rather stably. Stably? Maturely. At least that was the case until today. Whoopsie. Update two. Well, that didn't last long. Lawyer called first thing this morning. My wife changed her mind, rejecting all the house stuff we talked about. Says she wants to sell and move into something smaller. She is only rejecting the house agreements. Custody agreement is not being rejected. I told my lawyer, fine, I'm done. I told him, here's the offer from my side then. 50-50 custody still, but 50-50 split of the house sale. I'll still go 60-40 on savings. Now, I know some of you may say this is dumb or unfair, but I have my reasons and they all 
revolve around our daughter. I'm actually fine with this. Not even upset that she wasted four hours of our time on Saturday. I'm just ready to be done. After my initial tirade, I've really come into a good place. It's like I spent years carrying around a backpack of stones and I finally decided to put it down. Also, a personal response to OnlyFans models. Stop sending me invites and messages. I can jack off on my own just fine for free. I'm not going to repay you. Leave people the frick alone. <laughs> uh, it's nice to know that even men sometimes are unnecessarily harassed in DMs. Hooray, equality. <laughs> anyway, friends, we'll end the ramblings there. Thank you as always for watching. Love your face, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.